Hello, and welcome to another digital lecture for Salt Lake Community College. This lecture will cover section 5.4 for introduction to statistics, probability, and the addition rule. There are a few definitions in this section that we would like to be comfortable with. The first is the definition of a random process. This could be any activity that's based on randomness, such as rolling a die or flipping a coin. The individual results in your random process are referred to as the outcomes. Now, the law of large numbers tells us as more observations are collected, the proportion of occurrences with a particular outcome will get closer and closer to the probability P of that outcome. It's important to notice in this definition that P hat is going to be a sample proportion. This is going to be a point estimate for the true proportion. Of an outcome. So again, the law of large numbers tells us that as more and more observations are collected, your sample proportion, your point estimate, will get closer and closer to the true proportion of that outcome. And lastly, probability. The probability of an outcome is defined to be the proportion of times the outcome would occur if we observed the random process an infinite number of times where the probability of this outcome is calculated as the number of times the outcome occurs divided by the number of times the random process was repeated. So again, the law of large numbers tells us as the number of times this random process repeated increases, the estimate of the probability will get closer and closer to the true probability. Let's look at an example. Consider the flipping of a fair coin. And imagine we want to compute the proportion of heads observed after each toss. Now, as we know, a fair coin has one head and one tail. If we were to flip a fair coin, I do not think we would expect the coin to land on a head, then a tail, then a head, then a tail, then a head, then a tail, back and forth. It is more realistic to expect this random process to have maybe a head, tail, 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 head, so that these outcomes will vary from toss to toss. What we want to do is compute the proportion of heads that we observe after each toss. So for example, Maybe after a first toss, we see a, the coin lands on a head. And so that the proportion of heads that we would have observed at this point would have been one head out of one toss or one. Graphically, we could represent that at this point. Maybe after a second toss of our coin, we would see a tail. Now, for two tosses, we've seen one head. And so our proportion of heads would be one out of two or 0 0.5.
maybe we would see after a third toss another tail. So that after three tosses, we have seen one head so far for a proportion of one third or 0.33. Maybe after a fourth toss, we would see another tail. So cumulatively, we would have seen one head out of four tosses for a proportion of one fourth or 0.25. Maybe after a fifth toss, we would see another head. So that out of five tosses, we've seen two heads come up for a proportion of two out of five or 0 0.4. At this point, I would like to ask you to compute the proportion of heads that are observed after each of the next five tosses. It might be a good idea for you to pause the video here for a moment while you compute the next five proportions. I'll see you in a moment. Okay, I hope you paused the video for a moment while you computed the next five proportions. To verify that you have the right proportions, let's just look at these. After a sixth toss, maybe we got a tail, and so we would have observed two out of the six tosses being heads. After the next toss, maybe we'd see another head, so three out of seven for a proportion of 0.43. After the next toss, maybe another head, so four out of eight for 0.5. After another toss, maybe we would get a tail. So four out of nine would be heads for a proportion of 0.44. And maybe after a 10th toss, we would see another tail for a proportion of four out of 10 being heads. What we would like to notice is that these values are converging. They're getting closer to 0 0.5, which is the true probability of a fair coin landing on a head. This is illustrating the law of large numbers. Let's continue to look at probability. We would like to now look at disjoint events. These are sometimes also called mutually exclusive events. These are events that cannot both happen at the same time. This could be, for example, if you're flipping a coin, either you'll land on a head or a tail, but you can't land on both at the same time or if you're considering a deck of cards. Maybe you'd pull out a heart, or maybe you'd pull out a diamond. But these would be disjoint events because a card cannot be both a heart and a diamond at the same time. Now, when it comes to probability, we will oftentimes use the addition rule. For disjoint outcomes, this says that if A1 and A2 represent two disjoint outcomes, then the probability that one of these will occur is given by the probability of A1 or A2. And to calculate this probability, for disjoint outcomes, we could calculate the probability of A1 individually and the probability of A2 individually and then add these together. If there are many disjoint outcomes, 
then the probability that one of these occur would be the probability of A1 plus, plus the probability of A2 plus the probability of the next event and so forth. Next, an event is going to be a set or collection of outcomes. Now, when looking at events, it is often that we will see Venn diagrams. This is going to be a useful tool to depict the outcomes that can be categorized as in or out for two or three variables or attributes in a random process. Let's look at an example. Here are two different sets of Venn diagrams. And I would like to help you see how we can use these Venn diagrams when looking at a six-sided die. Now consider the different sets, these different events. Maybe you might want to look at, when rolling a six-sided die, how many of these values could be less than two, could be odd numbers, or could be even numbers. And so the numbers less than two on a six-sided die could be a one, The number of times or the number of sides of a die that are odd numbers would be one. We could also say two and, ooh, no, two is not an odd number. Three and five. And then the even numbers would be two, four, and six. If we were instead looking at a 20-sided die, we could have a different collection of events. The events could be which sides of your die are single digits, which sides have even numbers, and which sides are divisible by three. Where the intersection of these events would represent those outcomes that are in both events simultaneously. For example, if your die had a, the, the side it was a one, well, this would be a single digit, but it's not divisible by three and it's not an even number, so the one would go here. The next side of your die would be a two, now, it's, it's still a single digit, but it's an even number, and it's not divisible by three, so it would go here. The next side of your die would be a three. It's still a single digit, it's not an even number, and three is divisible by three, so we would like to put it in the intersection of the single digit and the divisible by three events. The next event would be, or the next outcome would be a four. A four is still a single digit. It's an even number, but it's not divisible by three. So make sure it's outside of the divisible by three event. The next side of your die would be a five, which is a single digit. It's not an even number and not divisible by three. The next side of your die would be a six. Now six is still a single digit. It's also an even number, and it's also divisible by three. So it would go in the intersection of all three of these events. A seven, 
would be a single digit that's not divisible by three, not an even number. An eight would be a single even digit that's not divisible by three, though. A nine, a single digit that's also divisible by three. 10, now a 10 is no longer a single digit, so it would go outside the single digit event, but it would be an even number that's not divisible by three. Then we would have 11. Now it's still one of your possible outcomes, but it's not a single digit, not an even number, and not divisible by three. Then we would have 12, which would be an even number, and also divisible by three, so it would be in the intersection of these two events. 13 would be neither a single digit, an even number, or divisible by three. 14, an even number. 15, now 15 is not an even number, but it is still divisible by three. 16, Seventeen, eighteen would be an even number and also divisible by three. Nineteen would be neither of these. And then finally twenty, which would be an even number that's not divisible by three. This is an example of how we can use Venn diagrams to represent the different types of events that we might be interested in. Now this about covers all the definitions for section 5.4 that I would like to discuss. If you have further questions, be sure to review the example videos that follow or ask your instructor.